Great, thank you, Chairman. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dr. Yi Chang Su from Taipei Medical University. And thanks for inviting me to join this wonderful conference. And I'm a vascular neurosurgeon and interventional neuroradiologist in my hospital. So today I'm going to talk about <clears throat> the strategy of the preoperative angiography that I use for my skull-based surgeon colleagues. And this strategy will mainly depend on some important anatomical variations that are relevant to the skull-based approaches. Okay, so let's start from two clinical scenario. In this first case, the patient had a cavernous sinus meningioma at the left side. So which treatment or surgical approach will you choose based on this MR imaging? If I give you these angiographic pictures, will you change your treatment plans? And let's look at the second case. The patient had a petroclavial meningioma at the right side with this venogram. Which, which surgical approach will you choose? How about the same tumor, but with a completely different venograms? So in order to make an optimal treatment plan, a detailed evaluation of the vascular anatomy is extremely important in skull-based surgery. Non-invasive images such as CT or MR are very helpful, but sometimes catheter and geography are still necessary. And this slide summarizes all the important vascular information that we should gather from all the vascular images we can get. And this evaluation is not limited to the vessels around the lesions, but also the vessels related to the surgical approach. So in this talk, we will focus on some examples of arterial or venous evaluation that will affect how we choose a surgical approach. And we will demonstrate how we gather this information from the common vascular images we can get. And we will focus on three classical skull-based approaches, including frontal temporal, anterior transpetroso and posterior transpetroso uh, pretoso approaches. And the vessels that are relevant to these approaches are middle meningeal artery, superficial middle cerebral vein, and superior petroso sinus. So let's start from the middle meningeal artery. We all know that it's a key step to divide the branches of middle meningeal artery during certain skull-based approaches. For example, meningeal orbital band detachment is a key step in anterior clinoidectomy. And this step will inevitably divide the meningeal orbital artery, which is the branch of middle meningeal artery. Similarly, in anterior transpetroso approach, it is also a key step to divide the middle meningeal artery at the level of the foramen spinosum. However, it is possible that the patient's ocular supply or the ophthalmic artery is not coming from the classical ICA, but is coming from the middle meningeal artery, like this angiogram. And also you can see the choroid blush from this um, ophthalmic artery. So this kind of artery that supplies the eye is called the meningo ophthalmic artery, the same artery that we will divide when we attempted to detach the meningo orbital band. The reason for this kind of anatomical variation can be explained by the embryological development of the ophthalmic artery and the middle meningeal artery. As you can see this, step-by-step -step drawing, adult type of thumb artery, which supplies both ocular and extraocular structures inside the orbit, is actually the results of the fusion or regression processes between the fetal of thumb artery, which is the red lines, and the middle meningeal artery, which is the blue lines. If this development process was different, numerous kinds of anatomical variation occurred. The variation that's relevant to our today's topic is this one. The middle meningeal artery becomes the main artery that supplies the eye. And you will see that in this case, the ophthalmic artery is actually not uh, going through the optic canal. It is going through the superior orbital fissure. If we did not notice this kind of anatomical variation and ligate the middle meningeal artery at either foramen spinosum or the meningeal orbital band, visual loss will be highly possible. And this potential complications has already been published before previously. The author in this case report, report reported that the reason for the blindness is because the patient's eye is supplied by the meningeal ophthalmic artery. And this artery is sacrificed during the meningeal orbital band detachment in approach. 
So in our previous angiography screening, we found that actually this kind of meningo ophthalmic artery variation is not that infrequent. Therefore, please carefully look at the vascular images you had. If you can identify the ophthalmic artery that passes through the optic canal, then it is safe. But if not, it is better to do an angiography to confirm where the orbit or ocular artery come from. If you can prove that the patient has a meningo ophthalmic variant, frontal temporal approaches involving anterior clinoidectomy, anterior transpetrosal approach will probably risk the visions. And the next vessel I'm going to discuss is the superficial middle cerebral vein. And this vein is usually traceable in thin cut contrast CT or MR scans. Embryological speaking, the superficial middle cerebral vein initially courses along the temporal base posteriorly into the tentorium and reaches the transverse sinus. It gradually migrates medially, regresses partially, and is finally captured by the cavernous sinus. So the adult type of the superficial middle cerebral vein empty into the sphenoparietal sinus and reach into the cavernous sinus. And this is named as the sphenoparietal type of the superficial middle cerebral vein. If the, uh, this vein is not captured by the cavernous sinus, but empty into the pterygoid plexus via the foramen ovale, then it is called the sphenobasal type. If the vein persists as its fetal type, which runs along the temporal base and back to into the tentorium or the transverse sinus, it is called the sphenopetrosal type. So in this case, for example, you'll see that the vein goes all the way to the foramen ovale over here. So it is a sphenobasal type. And in this case, this uh, vein goes along the temporal base to the superior petrosal sinus or the tentorium. So it is called the sphenopetrosal type. Please look carefully at this drawing published in this, uh, in this journal. The venous segment at the temporal lobe, the temporal base may be intradural, partially extradural, or completely extradural. Therefore, when surgical approaches involving epidural dissection at the temporal base, it may cause injury of the superficial middle cerebral vein and results in venous infarct. And of course, there's an anatomical variation that the superior middle cerebral vein is poorly differentiated, uh, developed, or drained superiorly into the frontal cortical veins. In these two situations, venous injury is less likely in anterior or posterior petrosectomy. So this article therefore summarized that some uh, superficial middle cerebral vein drainage pattern patterns may be favorable or non-favorable in either anterior or posterior transpetrosal approach. So uh, you can um, take the reference at this table and hopefully this table will help surgeons to choose a proper approach. Accurate determination of this uh, drainage pattern is important. In our practice, if the uh, superficial middle cerebral vein is easily traceable in CT scans, we will not perform the catheter angiography. However, if the tumor mask masks the drainage pattern of this vein, we will usually perform the conventional angiography to determine the exact drainage pattern. The last anatomical variation we are going to talk about is the superior petrosal sinus. And the reason to talk about this vein is because this sinus is usually ligated and divided in either anterior or posterior uh, transpetrosal approach. As you can see, the superior petrosal sinus lies on the top of the petrous bone, and it is the major outflow of the petrous veins, which collects the venous blood flow from parts of the cerebellum and the brainstem. So three types of the anatomical variation of this SPS uh, has been proposed. As you can see, most of the patients had a complete superior petrosal sinus or the lateral part of the superior petrosal sinus. But a minority of the people have a smaller, a medial type of the SPS. And this is a, an example of the lateral type of SPS, which drained posteriorly into the sigmoid sinus. And this is an example of a complete type of SPS. The venous flow predominantly drained posteriorly into the transverse sigmoid junction, but sometimes it drained anteriorly into the cavernous sinus. In the medial type, the SBS drained anteriorly into the cavernous 
sinus exclusively. And these are the CT scans that performed after an anterior or posterior petrosectomy. As you can see, SPS is actually divided at the different levels in both anterior and posterior transpetrosal approaches. Therefore, we can deduce that in anterior petros transpetrosal approach, it is safe to ligate the SPS in the lateral type of SPS or the complete type of SPS because the petrosal vein, uh, However, if we then it will be very dangerous if you divide a medial type of SPS because the petrosal vein will fail to empty into the cavernous sinus unless it is associated with the rich venous collaterals. On the contrary, uh, in posterior transpetrosal approach, it is less limited by this SPS variation as long as the SPS belongs to the medial type or the SPS was divided anterior to the point where the petrosal vein enters. Therefore, we can summarize again that an SPS change pattern may be one of the key players in choosing either anterior or posterior transpetrosal approach. However, since it is usually more difficult to identify the SPS in the non-invasive images, in our practice, we would prefer to do conventional angiography when we choose a skull-based approach that requires SPS division. In conclusion, the middle meningeal artery, superficial middle cerebral vein, and the superior petrosal sinus are all important vascular anatomies that should be carefully analyzed before choosing a proper skull-based approach. These are just some examples. Remember, presence of anatomical variation is a rule rather than an exception. And this rule also applies to the vessel that we tend to neglect, such as middle meningeal artery. So in our daily practice, when we face with a skull-based tumor, we will think of several possible approaches first. Many factors affect our surgical approach of choice. And today I mentioned the, one of the major uh, determined factor is the vessels that will be encountered or sacrificed in a certain surgical approach. Therefore, we have to determine what vessels we should look for and understand all the possible anatomical variation related to that vessel. Next, find those vessels and define its pattern by using the non-invasive images we had. If it is undetermined, we will suggest to perform a catheter angiography first. Hopefully, this strategy will help surgeons to choose a proper surgical approach. So thanks for your attention.